We're good. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is day two of our polynomial functors class. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope everyone found the recording for the first class OK. Um, it, we, again, we cut out halfway through, but I think, I think we patched it up, and it's online right now. Um, but just a very quick, uh, uh, I guess, review of what we talked about last time. We introduced our objects of study, these polynomial functors. And they are, uh, we wrote them out as these sums of representable functors. Um, for example, here we have a, an example of a polynomial functor. Now yesterday, or not yesterday, but last time we were writing this as something like uh, y squared plus 2y plus 1. But really, we want to think of these numbers, instead of as numbers, as sets. And so th this time, I've actually uh, named the elements of the set. And so really, this, uh, I've, rewritten, I've rewritten this y squared as y to this two element set here. Um, these two as two uh, one element sets here and here. And one, you can just think of as y to the power of the empty set. And so I've written that here as well. Um, yeah, and we saw a couple of different ways of viewing these polynomials. We could draw them out as these uh, tree pictures like this, where each root represents one of the summons of the polynomial, uh, which we also call the positions of the polynomial. And each uh, leaf of, uh, from each root are the, uh, are the elements of the exponents. Uh, which we call the directions of the polynomial at those positions. And so we have this other picture here, and I've just gone ahead and labeled them with the uh, names of the elements here. Now, another way to view these polynomials uh, we saw was as either as these um, systems with uh, inputs and outputs, or as these decisions that we were making. Um, and so one, uh, one way you can think of this polynomial here is that we have this kind of menu of possible decisions. Um, if we're at this decision, we can choose to either go left or right. Um, if we're at this decision, we have to go left. That's our only choice. If, it's at, if we're at this decision, we have to go right. And if we're here, um, we can't do anything. This is an impossible decision. We're stuck. Um, yeah, and so... Uh, yeah, so that's a bit of a review of last time. And now I'm going to finish up our sort of overview from last time to talk about how we can actually think about these polynomials as uh, sort of this like relationship between these polynomials and series of decisions slash um, dy uh, dynamical systems and how that ties into the data story as well. And uh, so I really like... Um, I really like text adventures, and which are those like games where you're you can like type in commands, like um, you're at some like weird um, place, like some castle or something, and you can type in like pick up this, or you can like uh, type in like go to this, um, and so you can think of a dynamical system as sort of a uh, kind of like a game like that, um, except our uh, game here is just going to have uh, two very simple commands, um, which are left or right. Um, but you can't always go left or right. Now, if I were designing this game, um, I might say that if you started at the moat, you could go left to the tower or right uh, to the sea. Um, but once uh, you get to the sea, maybe you're stuck in the sea. And if you try to go, you can't go left. And if you try to go right, you just end up back uh, in the sea again. Um, or you could go uh, from the cottage left to the beach, from where you can only go right to the sea. Um, or you can start from the tower and go left to the dungeon or right to the beach. You can't go anywhere from dungeon uh, into the, or you can't go anywhere from the dungeon, and you can neither get in nor out of heaven. Um, so that's this is our uh, text adventure here. Um, and so this you might call this a flowchart if you're thinking in terms of decisions. You might think of this as a state diagram if you're thinking of uh, dynamical systems with states. And in fact, I'll call each of these rooms a uh, a state. And each of these, if you focus on one of these states, you can actually map out 
the future um, from that state. Uh, and this is what I mean by this. So if we take, if we start from the moat, for example, um, we can construct this like binary tree of all of the options we can take starting from the moat and then just like going, like continuing to go. Like for example, if we start uh, from the moat, I'm just gonna label this M, we can either go left or right. Um, if we go left, we get to the tower, as we can see here. And from the tower, we can only go left, um, which takes us to, oh, sorry, no, yeah. From the tower, we can go left or right. Um, so that takes us either to the dungeon, from which we can't go any further, or to the beach, uh, from which we can go right again to the sea. And then from there, we can just keep going right. And this, I can't actually draw this, but it just keeps going with a bunch of S's. Um, alternatively, if we went right from the moat, we would also end up at the sea. And then it would just be this long ray of rights this way. And so now we have this instance of this binary tree. And notice that every sort of like, if you start from every node of this binary tree and then consider sort of like all the edges coming out of it, this is just a version of this, right? So these trees are built up from a bunch of copies of these um, smaller Corollas sort of stacked on top of each other. Um, and if you think about it, all of the possible uh, ways to stack these on top of each other form all of the possible kind of binary trees we get. And these are specifically, I'm calling these binary trees, but specifically I mean like trees where each node uh, has maybe a left children, maybe a right, uh, maybe a left child, maybe a right child, maybe both, and maybe neither. And so that's represented by all four of our options here. And uh, so one thing to note about these trees is that these trees actually form a category. Now, we'll get into this in more detail, I believe, all the way in day nine. Um, but just to preview what's going on, um, this category has morphisms. Uh, so the objects, these tr uh, the objects of this category are these trees. And then the morphisms of this category are rooted paths of these trees. So for example, if we take, um, if we take this path along the tree and maybe stop here, um, it's a morphism from this entire tree to uh, the codomain of this morphism, which is just this portion of the tree here. And so that forms a category. And you might have to think about that a little bit um, uh, to think about how things compose. Uh, but actually, I'll just, I'll just keep that there. Um, but for now, let's finish drawing the futures of these other um, rooms. So for example, if we started from the cottage, we would draw something like this, because you go from the cottage to the beach and then to the sea. Um, if we started from heaven, we couldn't go anywhere, so we just stay there. Um, and you'll notice that for all of these other rooms, uh, for example, for the tower, you can actually already, we've actually already drawn the tree for the tower. It's just this upper portion of the tree up here, um, labeled T. And so now we have this category of trees, but we've, uh, which, uh, so, uh, sorry, so this category of trees, we don't, uh, we ignore the labels, right? We're just focusing on like the shapes of these trees. Uh, but once we add in the labels, what kind of thing are we getting? Well, uh, we're basically getting a uh, functor from this category into set. And let me, let me actually draw just these objects, the, the relevant objects of this category. Um, let's see, so for each object, so one thing, oh, one thing to notice is that some of these rooms actually have the same futures associated with them. Uh, for example, the beach um, has this entire, sort of this long uh, tree here, which is just a rightward ray um, as its relevant object um, or as its future, uh, which is identical to the future of the C, actually. And so um, what we do is we take this object, this tree, and send it to the set 
of all, uh, of all rooms here that have this as its possible future. Um, so let me, let me give a way of looking at this. Um, I'm going to label these trees, uh, the different types of trees we see, so you can see what's going on. Um, let's see. Let me call this big tree uh, V. And then this portion, so just this part and that part, I'm going to call this tree X. Um, and then I'm going to call this tree, uh, sorry, V, W, X. Um, and then I'm going to call this right word Ray. Um, I'm going to call this Y. But then this Y actually shows up here again, and also like here and here. And I'm labeling each tree at uh, the roots of that tree. Um, and then we also have this like tree that goes nowhere, and I'm just going to call that Z. And so this, uh, the relationship between all of these, do you have a question? Sorry. Yeah. You're in the middle of something. Yes, OK. Um, the relationship between all of these, we can write out as a, uh, as a I guess, a subcategory of this category of trees, where we can start um, from the tree V, um, go left. Uh, go left to x, go right to y. Um, from y, if we go right again, we end up right back at, sorry, this is a right, we end up right back at y. From x, if we go left, we end up at z. Um, from x, if we go right, we end up at y. Um, and from w, if we go left, we end up, this is actually also a y, because it's a right word ray. So if we start from w and go left, and that's uh, this little portion of the category, um, it's going to be all of the objects that actually have um, non-empty sets associated with them here. Um, yeah? yeah, that's your question. I guess, yeah. I guess, I, maybe this is just what you were going to say. Mm -hmm. Each, um, each of these boxes, or? Yeah, yeah so um, each box gets a tree, but that's not necessarily unique, right? Because, um, for example, again, if you start at the beach, you can only go right, and then you can only go right, and then you can only go right. And so it looks like a tree that's just a ray that keeps going right. Um, but if you start at the sea, it's actually the same thing happening. You can only go right, you can only go right, you can only go right. So it's also going to be this like ray that goes rightward. And so you can imagine like slightly more complicated systems where there are going to be a bunch of, uh, a bunch of rooms that actually all have the same future, as long as you don't label them, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't they be like distinct objects in the category, or just isomorphic? They would be, I, I suppose you can, um, uh, we're, we're, considering, we're considering a category where they actually are just the same object in the category. Um, I think, I'm sure you could do it so that they're just actually isomorphic, but there's not really much reason to do that. I think they are, you think of them as like uh, the same object in the category. Yeah. Yes, exactly, right. So um, the next thing we're going to do um, is to actually assign each object here a set, and I'm going to use maybe a different color for this so that you can. OK, um, let's see. So again, uh, the moat is, uh, is the only room with this particular future. So we're going to assign uh, V to the set M. Sorry if this is hard to read. Um, let's see. Uh, the, let's see, the, object, uh, the, the tree W, sorry, the tree W has only one uh, room here that looks like this, so it gets that one set to C. Um, similarly, X gets a T. Um, the more interesting ones are here, right? Um, as we mentioned, both B and S, both the beach and the C, get the future tree Y. And both, um, both D and H get the future tree Z. And now, uh, so we've assigned each object 
a, uh, a set, but in order to actually give a functor from this category to set, we need to tell you how each of these, uh, each of these elements map to other elements. Um, but that's just, uh, that just uh, stated by this um, diagram here, um, because we know that starting from the moat and going left takes us to the tower. Well, I guess there was only one option there, so it had to go there. Um, but going right from the moat goes to the C. So that's how you know that M uh, under R maps to S rather than B. And then you can fill in the rest of the functor like this. Um, yeah, and this is where things, uh, now I could, I could just keep drawing this, um, but then this will get rather messy. So another way we can write down this uh, functor into set is using these tables um, that are going to look a little like databases. Um, and so you may, you may or may not know that a functor into set, you can always uh, portray as a certain database um, where we, uh, so for example, uh, objects of type v, sorry, the object v is associated with uh, one set uh, that just contains m. And from v, you can either go left or right. And so from m, going left is going to take us to t. Going right is going to take us to s. And so we can write down similarly um, with uh, the object w. It has one element in the, its associated set, which is c. And from W, you can only go left. And so C, actually, the cottage goes to the beach. So that's where that goes. Um, and then we can keep making a table like this. Um, object X, the only one, uh, the only room with future X is T. Um, from X, you can go either left or right. From T, you can go either left to D or right to B. Um, there are two elements uh, in the set associated with y, um, namely b and s. From y, you can only go right. Um, and actually, both of these take you to s. And finally, you have this kind of boring table here with just d and h without anywhere to go from there. And so we can turn this, uh, turn this kind of uh, state diagram here into a database like this. Yeah. And that is the story here. Um, now, you can imagine, uh, for example, if we expanded this uh, state diagram, we might add more entries to these tables. Um, and these might get like really big. And then we might want to ask questions of these tables. For example, we might, uh, you, we might want to ask, given all rooms that have futures that look like this, um, if we go, uh, like, tell me all of the rooms with futures like this, that if you go left and then right, it's the same thing as going right. Um, now, we know that that's possible because this, um, they both, uh, going left and then right gets us to a point with the same future as then going right, which we can also see here if we go start from V, go left to X, and then go right to y, it's the same thing as going right there. Um, and so we might ask for all of the, uh, all of the rooms that, ha uh, that satisfy this condition. Um, and that's going to be a query on our table. Now, it turns out that there are no rooms here, at least, that satisfy that condition. Um, but if we had instead asked um, for all of the rooms that satisfy that condition or satisfy a different condition where if you go left, then right, it's the same thing as going right and then right, um, we actually have uh, the one room, let's see, what is it, the one room M, if you go left, you get to T, and then go right to B, it's the same thing as going right to S. Oh, sorry, let's see, left, wait, what am I doing? Um, left and then right, left, sorry, left to T, and then right to, do I have this right? B, right, uh, and then right again, sorry. Let's see, yeah, sorry, left again, right, and then right. It's the same thing as going right once. OK, sorry if that was confusing. Yes? Mm -hmm. Are we going to talk about what those queries are categorically? Yes, so it turns out that those queries. Question. I, in the audience, I 
oh, sorry about that. Yeah, 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 I should repeat that. Um, thank you for reminding me, David. Um, the question was, uh, what are these queries categorically? Um, you can think of, so you can think of this query as spitting out a set. Um, and then more generally, you can actually think of uh, more maybe generalized queries that take um, one of these uh, database instances and turn it into a different database instance uh, for a different underlying category. Um, and so we, and then we call these uh, data migration functors. And it turns out that these uh, data migration functors are going to be exactly the by modules over comonoids in our uh, in our category of polynomials. Let me back up a bit because that was a lot of weird words. Um, and you'll see this, I think by the end of the class, uh, you should understand all of the things I just said. Um, but essentially, it turns out that um, the, uh, there is all of this, everything I just said so far ties back to a certain monoidal structure on our category of polynomials, which we'll introduce at the very end of the day today. Um, but these. Um, it turns out that comonoids with respect to that monoidal structure are actually just small categories. Um, and you can represent any category um, uh, within, basically you can recover any category within uh, the category of polynomial functors. Now, these specific categories of trees turn out to be the co-free comonoids in that uh, category with respect to this uh, monoidal structure. Um, and then co-presheaves on this category, so uh, functors from this category to set, um, they turn out to be um, co-algebras for, uh, for, uh, for this same polynomial. Yeah? But to be clear, you're going to define all the words you're saying. You're not yes. expecting anyone to know any of them. Yes, yes. I just want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, just to be clear, I'm not expecting anyone to actually understand what I'm saying right now. If you do understand that, hopefully you can get the excitement of like what I'm trying to convey right now. Um, but basically, the whole idea of this is that all of everything I'm doing here can actually be recovered um, with just like uh, the categorical pro uh, properties of this particular category. Great. OK, I'm going to pause for a second to drink water, uh, but then we will get back into this. If anyone has any questions. This diagram with this polynomial? Yeah. yeah, so everything, um, let's see. So you can think of one of these, uh, one of these rooms as, have, as being associated with one of the positions of the polynomial. And so for example, this one is associated with the position that has uh, the, uh, this position that goes left and right. And so which is why from here you can have, you can go left or right. The, the target, well, I mean, the target isn't sort of encoded, at least in just the polynomial. Um, the thing you get to from here, um, yeah, no, it's not encoded in the polynomial. It's given, yeah, it's given in, it is given in the, in the category, though, once you, hmm? yeah. So is, is this, that is a co algebra Yes, yes. It turns out that this, this is, yes, this is a co-algebra of this, of this polynomial, yeah. Um, yes. But that also happens to be a um, co pre sheaf on this particular category of trees, yeah. Again, people are not expected. Yes, yes. But this is just for, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, people, you aren't necessarily expected to know what uh, uh, any of those mean, um, but we will get to those, yeah. OK, any other questions? Cool. Uh, let's actually, that sort of concludes our like preview of this course. Um, we'll see each of these things play out uh, uh, like over the next few days. Hopefully that's something to look forward to. Um, but for now, let's talk about um, this category of polynomial functors. Because last time we defined what a polynomial functor was, um, but in order to have a category, we need to actually tell you what the morphisms of this category are. and 
In fact, our morphisms between these polynomial functors are sort of the most uh, natural kind of morphism between uh, functors, namely natural transformations. Um, and so here is our definition. So given polynomial functors, given polynomial functors P and Q, a polynomial morphism, really I should be saying uh, morphism of polynomials, but I'll just call this a polynomial morphism for now, is a natural transformation from P to Q, from P to Q, yeah. Um, you might see this with two arrows for natural transformations, but we'll only just use the one arrow. Um, and so poly is the category uh, with objects as polynomial functors and morphisms are these uh, polynomial morphisms, which are natural transformations. Okay, but, um, uh, or so another way of thinking of poly is that it is the uh, full subcategory. Uh, there's this inclusion from poly to uh, functors on set, or functors from set to set. And it's the full subcategory of this category uh, spanned by all of the ones that are polynomials, so all of the ones that are uh, co-products of representables. But this is a lot of data uh, contained in this one polynomial morphism, right? Because a natural transformation is a bunch of functions, right? It's a function for every possible set um, S a function from P of S to Q of S. And that's a lot to deal with. And so is there any other sort of way we can interpret these polynomial morphisms uh, that's a little more compact? It turns out there is. Um, if we just do a quick computation. So, kind of like weirdly out of breath, I don't know why. Um, this is, yeah, so let's see. So I'm gonna write uh, poly of P comma Q to be uh, the set of morphisms, uh, the set of polymorphism, uh, polynomial morphisms from P to Q. And really, again, we should think of these as the natural transformations from P to Q. Now, I'm going to write out P as this uh, form that we had last time. Um, it's a sum over all of the positions of P of these representables. And P bracket I, again, is the notation for uh, the, the set being represented by the, uh, the uh, representable corresponding to this position. And comma Q. OK, so that's just replacing P with this. Um, and now, what you may notice is that we have a, uh, a coproduct of representables on this side. And since this is a coproduct of, or since this is a coproduct in this category, uh, in this bigger category, and since we're just taking a um, full subcategory of this bigger category, we can think of this as an actual coproduct in our category poly. And think of this, instead of just as one morphism, as a bunch of morphisms, one for each i in P of one of a natural transformation from uh, this representable to Q. Now, if we have a natural transformation from a representable to a, uh, to an, uh, let's see, to a functor from set to set, we can apply the Yonena lemma, which tells us that this, uh, this set of uh, the set of natural transformations is naturally isomorphic to Q applied to this set, uh, P bracket I. And if we write out what this actually means in terms of, uh, if we expand Q the same, way ex the same way we expanded P up here, 
we see that we simply have a product over positions of p of a sum over positions of q of this p bracket i sort of raised to the power of q bracket j. What is this thing? It's going to be, uh, so what, what are we saying here? So we're saying that to specify a morphism from p to q, we need to specify for each position of p two things. A position of q corresponding to that position, um, namely uh, a position that we call j, and then a morphism, or a, sorry, a function, um, because morphisms in the category of sets are just functions, a function from q bracket j to p bracket i. And so what this turns out to look like is kind of what I drew out last time. So you, draw, uh, you take a position, let's say we have a position, uh, this is some position of p with two directions. Um, it's going to be set to a position of q. Uh, let's say it has, maybe it has three directions. So that's this part here. Um, but then we also have to specify a function from q bracket j, which is the set of directions up here, to p bracket i, which is the set of directions up here. Uh, so for example, we could send, uh, let's say, this, this direction here, maybe this direction also to here, and then this direction all the way over here. And so that specifies uh, at least one part of this uh, uh, morphism of polynomials. Um, this, again, we have to do this for every direction, uh, sorry, for every position of P. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, mm -hmm. where, where in the formula is it encoded that J, uh, you know, is the image of I? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the question is where in this formula is it encoded that j is sort of like the image of i. So I guess this is kind of two questions. So one thing is, first of all, I'm just sort of interpreting what kind of, what kind of set this is. And this is a set where we're taking a product over i's of the sum over j's. And so which means that um, if we ignore this part for, uh, for now, uh, for each i, you have to, uh, if I give you an i, you have to give me a j here. So that's sort of this part of it. And you can think of that as a function. Now, it also turns out, though, that um, this function, um, which we're going to denote as, um, at least we're sometimes going to denote as, um, let me name this something. So if we have a morphism f from p to q, this part of it, the part where we send a position of p to a position of q, um, we're going to denote by f sub 1. Um, and the reason we do that is because uh, it actually turns out that this is the one component of this natural, uh, of this natural transformation. Um, and you can work this out if you actually sort of work out the correspondence that, you know, uh, that the proof of the unit lemma gives you. This actually works out um, exactly how you expect it to. Um, the other piece of notation, though, is that for all i in p of 1, we also specify a function backwards, um, and we're going to call this f sharp sub i um, from q bracket j. But q bracket j here is just whatever i uh, gets sent to by f of 1, sorry, f sub 1, um, back to uh, p bracket i. And so you can see that we have this, uh, for each morphism, we have a function forward on positions, and then a function backwards from q to p on directions for each position of p. And this is a little confusing to wrap your head around. Um, you might want to sort of like try this for yourself. Um, this is uh, all spelled out in the book. Um, but let's see. But this is, uh, this is sort of the reason why this interpretation of polynomials as these 
um, positions that each have directions is useful because you can talk about these morphisms only in terms of these positions and directions, and that's it. And you don't even have to think about the functor picture much. And in fact, we won't be thinking about them as functors very much from here on out. Um, let's see. Okay, any other questions at this point? Cool. Um, now, uh, I should tell you how to actually once we have these morphisms, I should tell you how to compose these morphisms. And again, this is something you can work out um, if you work through exactly what this series of isomorphisms is telling you. Um, and we, uh, if you go to the relevant section in the book, by the way, I will probably, by tomorrow, I will go in and sort of add the relevant sections of the book that you can take a look at. Um, we're still kind of polishing them up but that you can look at to like uh, work this out for yourself. Um, but if you do follow that, um, it turns out that you can figure out how to compose these morphisms. Um, specifically, if, uh, oh, first of all, um, we're going to use this notation um, f semicolon g to mean um, composing f then g. So for example, if f is a morphism from P to Q, um, and then G is a morphism from Q to R, F then G is going to be this composition. And we're gonna call this H. Um, yeah, and so what does this mean in the world of polynomials? If P, Q, and R are all polynomials, F and G are things of this form. Um, well, first of all, uh, the Morphisms, uh, the functions on positions are going to compose exactly how you expect them to. So um, it's going to turn out that h sub 1 is going to be equal to f sub 1 and then g sub 1. So the positions of p get sent by f to the positions of q, which then get sent to another position of r, and then h does the same thing on those positions. Um, however, we have another, uh, the thing on directions is going to look a little different because uh, functions on directions go backwards. And so instead, uh, we have to say that for all i and p of 1, for all positions of p, um, what's going on? So we have this p bracket i. And f, backwards on positions, is going to give us a function backwards from q bracket um, f sub 1 of i back to p bracket i via f sub i sharp. Um, now, just for sort of convenience, hopefully um, this doesn't confuse anyone, we'll probably omit these parentheses sometimes. Um, we might even omit, omit this one sometimes if it's, uh, if it's clear what we're talking about. Um, but I'll keep that there for now. Um, and then g, well, a position i at p is going to get sent to uh, f sub 1 of i here, which is then going to get sent to g sub 1 of f sub 1 of i here. And so we're going to get a function backwards on directions uh, from uh, that's, let's see, that's g sharp sub f sub 1 of i from r bracket g1 f1 of i back to q bracket f1 of i. Um, and it's going to turn out that, well, you can compose these two functions. And since g sub 1 of f sub 1 of i is just h sub 1 of i, so this is also just r bracket h sub 1 of i, um, this is exactly the kind of function you need uh, to define h sub i sharp on directions, and in fact, this uh, we do want this to commute. So if we were to write this out as a formula, it would be something like this. So g, uh, g sharp sub f sub 1 of i, compose, or, and then f sub i sharp. 
And so you can see that um, this is a bit of a process, but basically any commutative diagram that you see in poly, you can always think of as like one commutative diagram for the positions, and then flip all the arrows, uh, figure out, uh, pick one position of where you're starting from, and then this sort of backwards commutative diagram of directions. And that's how you can check that things commute in poly. And once we know how to check these things, we can figure out uh, coproducts and products. Um, let's see, I have 10 minutes left, so, or I guess, I guess I'll go to five. So I have about 15 minutes left, so let's see if we can hit all of these, uh, but for now, any questions? Is there anything in the chat? Are we good? Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna erase this, and we'll talk about coproducts. And we already kind of used coproducts when we were working through here, um, so it should come as no surprise that a uh, co-products in poly are just given by addition um, or summation if it's a larger co-product. Um, so let's have an example here, right? So uh, for example, if we were to find the co-product of 2y squared and y cubed plus y plus, uh, yeah, plus y plus 1, I guess this is an example where we don't combine much. Um, we just add them up, and then that's also a polynomial, and that's the coproduct. Um, and if you think of this in pictures, uh, it's, I guess, even more boring. Um, if we have, uh, here's a picture of 2y squared. Uh, here's a picture of y cubed plus, plus y plus 1 which is just three arrows like this, and then one like this, and then one with nothing. Um, their sum is just you just draw these together, and then that gives you uh, their sum. Um, and of course, uh, taking the sum is uh, commutative, so you can rearrange everything uh, as you like. Um, that's how you define a coproduct. And you can kind of already see, if you just sort of stare at this and think about it, that a morphism out of this thing is really just a morphism out of like this part and then another morphism out of this part, which is exactly what you want a co-product uh, co to be. Um, but there's, a, uh, there's an exercise, if you want to like formally check this, you can play around with these commutative diagrams a bit um, and you can do this if you so desire uh, to get some practice with these diagrams. Okay, um, let's instead talk about uh, products. And once again, uh, by product, I mean the categorical product or the Cartesian product. Um, and once again, it is exactly what you would expect. Um, if you have two polynomials like this, it is just their product when you multiply them out as polynomials. Um, now this can get a little bit tricky if you have infinite sums. So let me just write out sort of a general case. If we have something like this multiplied by something like this, the way you want to think about this is uh, kind of like do the distributive property. And so every term is going to be a term from here times a term from here. And so it's going to turn out that this will be the sum over these pairs of i and p of 1 and j and q of 1, which of course we can also just write as this double sum of the products of these two things. And if you take the product of two powers, you just add the exponents as you might expect. So one way you can talk about this, um, actually, uh, this is, you can think of this as a double sum, but I'm actually going to write this as a single sum of pairs, because that's a little easier to think about uh, the way we're talking about these. And so these are pairs, i comma j, of positions of p and of q. Okay. Um, and so one way you can think about this is 
that a product of two polynomials is going to be uh, you take you take the product of their positions, and then for each pair of positions, um, the direction set at that position is going to be the sum of the respective direction sets uh, of the original polynomials. Now, it's a little hard to understand that in words, so if we draw this out, if we draw out this example again, um, draw it out like this. Um, so here we have 2y squared, which we can think of as y squared plus y squared multiplied by, ooh, I don't know if we'll have, let me do it a little bit backwards here, um, multiplied by uh, y cubed plus y plus 1. And the positions of the result, well, there's two positions here and three positions here. So the positions of the result, there's going to be six different positions, um, one for each pair of their Cartesian product. And then to get, ooh, I should have done this. I'm going to quickly switch colors here. Let me see if I can, let's go with, no, that's too close. Let's see. Um, do this with different colors just to highlight what's going on. So for each pair of positions, uh, the set of directions, um, we take the directions from here um, and then add them to the directions from the bottom here. Yeah. And then, wait, what did you say? <laughs> Sorry. OK, never mind. <laughs> OK, um, and then you can just, yeah, so you can keep adding these up like this. Um, and yeah, what do I want to say about this? Um, you can see that there is a projection um, from this product to uh, the respective uh, things you're multiplying by, um, by seeing that, right, so for example, the projection down here, um, you send each position down to this, pos uh, whatever position it was, and then you send, for example, these three directions to uh, these three directions here, and then these three directions to there, and so on. And so that gives you the projections. David, do you have a question? Well, do you think you could give an interpretation of coproducts in terms of decisions, ooh, interesting. Like what yeah, so for example, oh yeah, so David asks if we can give a interpretation of these coproducts and products in terms of decisions, um, and the answer is yes. Um, uh, yeah, so for example, here you can just think of these as, let's see. Like Alice and Bob, each have decisions. Yeah, so we have, right, so we have, Let's just say, yes, Alice has a decision to make here. And Bob, or Alice has a menu of possible decision, decisions here. Bob has a menu of possible decisions here. And now you can either think of Alice um, and Bob sort of separately delegating their decisions to some third party um, uh, Eve, or you can think of them as kind of combining all of their sort of this entire menu together and whichever decision of either Alice's or of Bob's uh, they want to figure out at that point, um, that's the decision that they send forward. And then uh, Eve sends some direction back that way. And yeah, you can, you can think about sort of the details there. You mean the mass projection, just like, hmm? yeah. So you just combine the two menus. Yeah, you just combine the two menus, exactly. Um, whereas here, um, if we are multiplying, we have, let's see, Alice is here. Bob is here. Um, we are combining a menu of decisions where they're both making a decision at once, right? Like um, they're they're sort of uh, Alice needs to make a decision and Bob also needs to make a decision. So they're both making a decision, and their options for the decision uh, 
yeah, except, except that the options for the decision are just sort of like either Alice, uh, the choices of Alice's or the choices of Bob's. So really, it's that we are making, we are saying that we're making either Alice's decision or Bob's decision, but we're only picking options from one of them. Yeah, you might have to think about that. And it's going to, it's going to, this is going to turn out to be a little easier to think about, I think, next time when David talks about um, products of dynamical systems, or actually specifically what, how you can interpret these products um, in terms of dynamical systems. Yeah. And once again, if you want to think about how the, this actually satisfies uh, the universal property of the product, you can just sort of work it through with these diagrams here. Um, it's, uh, again, it's good to get some practice. Um, and in fact, I'll just say this quickly, and we'll probably, uh, we'll see if we can come back to this on day five. Um, it turns out that limits in poly in general are going to be of this form where you take uh, the limit on positions, and then for whichever position specifically you're taking, you take the co-limit of the directions corresponding to that position. And it turns out specifically uh, just because of this sort of forwards and backwards kind of motion. And so specifically here, products, you can think of as products of positions and then co-products of directions. Uh, co-limits are a little more complicated, unfortunately, because of how these diagrams break out. Um, but we can, uh, we'll see if we have time to look at those as well. Now I am going to introduce, um, in these last four minutes, uh, put my water over there, um, two more monoidal structures on the category poly. Um, the first one are what we call parallel products, which we denote by this tensor. And you might just hear me calling it tensor products or just tensors, um, or David calling them these. Um, and what we do here is that instead of taking, we still take the product of positions, just like the categorical product. But instead of taking the sum of these direction sets, we take the product of these direction sets. Um, so what happens is that, um, yeah, I guess if we just look at sort of what happens to monomials, um, if we have two monomials like this, a y to the b um, tensor c y to the d, um, this turns out to be we still take the product of a and c, but we actually just multiply um, b and d together. Whereas if this were just regular times, we would add these two together. Um, yeah, and then, and then uh, this tensor distributes over addition. Turns out that products also distribute over sums um, when we do this in poly. Um, but yeah. Yeah, exactly, which actually seems a little more natural. Yes, um, sorry, yes, repeat the question, OK. Um, uh, uh, Sophie just asked, is this like when we are picking from, uh, like picking an option from Alice's menu and picking a an option from Bob's menu? And yes, that is, in fact, the case. You could see me hesitating to try to like make um, these products kind of like work well with the decision story. But actually, these work very well, because it is just um, a decision on, uh, for Alice and a decision for Bob, and then you make both a choice for Alice and a choice for Bob. Yeah. Um, this, uh, by calling this a mon oh, first of all, if I'm actually going to say that this is a monoidal structure, I'm not actually going to go through the proof of this, um, but uh, what, uh, what would be the unit of this monoidal structure? I'm just going to open it up. Why? Yeah, exactly. If you uh, if you take any polynomial p um, o times uh, like <laughs> sorry uh, tensor it by y, um, you can see that if c and d are both one, they just go away, and this this is just still p, um, and it works the other way. So this is actually a symmetric monoidal um, structure. Um, so we have this poly comma y comma tensor, um, and you can work out what this does. On, I could tell you what this does 
on morphisms as well, but it's basically just putting two morphisms next to each other. Like it's, you're not really doing anything at all if you draw this out. Um, and let's see, um, yeah. And then finally, I'm just gonna briefly mention this. If you, there is one more monoidal uh, structure on here that we will talk more about on day six, which is just um, composition. So if you have 2y squared, you can compose it with y cubed plus y plus one uh, to get, uh, and this is just replacing the y here with this, and it's just like two of this uh, squared. And then it turns out that this product is also going to be very important. And we're going to see exactly how it plays out. It also has an interesting sort of picture in terms of these Corollas. Um, but we're going to leave that for another day. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, one quick comment. Uh, you can see it in the description for the video. But um, at this point, now that we've introduced uh, these uh, tensors, um, David actually gave a talk, I think last or maybe like two weeks ago, um, about uh, monoids with respect to this particular structure. And so there's a link in the description of that talk. And so you should be able to understand that talk at this point, um, given everything we've covered here. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? Otherwise, that's it. Yeah, I'd love an idea. Or yeah, sorry. I guess, first of all, questions. Let's hear questions first. That's it? My question is, can we Okay. Go for it, yes. Thank you. My idea is the system's like a run off, like you have. Mm -hmm. Here's the back. No. Is it run off after? Like, Alice has to choose her set of things that she'll put into the pool, and Bob chooses a set of things she'll put into the pool, and they have to choose one. Yeah, it's like you can eat one cake, and yeah. Alice and Bob both have a menu of cakes they want to choose from. Yeah. You first pick Alice or Bob to choose. And then they choose which cake they want. So you come up with one cake. Wait, isn't the opposite of that? We're talking about for the for the product. Yeah. Isn't that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Like if you had I mean, single arrows. You could think of them as like Democrats and Republicans. And like first you do first you choose horizontally, and then you have to choose between the two. Maybe this is the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Just cool. different versions of the same <laughs> scenario, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They each have a menu of decisions they can make. They each point to one. Uh -huh. And then there, there's like some options that Bob could add and an option, some options that Alice could add, and then together they decide, all right, let's go with Alice as option three. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because I was trying to, right, like when I was describing it over here, I was trying to make sure it actually sort of worked with the, the of co-product story. So like if we actually had, what is it? Um, that doesn't work. I mean, maybe this is already pretty clear. Um, but if we actually had a morphism into P and then another morphism into Q, like how is that actually a morphism here? So it is just kind of a yeah, you're kind of delegating the, uh, whoever has uh, the menu R is delegating a sort of choice to two different people. And they're not necessarily gonna listen to both of these people, right? But there are, they are gonna delegate their decision to both of these people. And then this is, and then one of them is gonna give back uh, something and then, an, or like they each could give back something, but really only one of them gives back something and then that's, uh, the choice we go with, yeah. Cool. Oh, no, no, no. The yeah? 